Thank you very much. So uh, here's the plan of the talk. We are going to start with an introduction to, to HHSs. And so then we are going to talk about their boundaries. And there's various things you can do with the boundary of an HHS. Uh, the thing I decided to mostly focus on today is some notion of geometrical finiteness. Okay, so introduction to HHS. So let me start. Okay, first of all, I will not give the full definition because the full definition is very long, but I will uh, explain some of the, um, you know, the most interesting features of the geometry of an HHS. So let me start with a list of examples to try and get you interested in this because so the, uh, I mean, the examples are, uh, groups that you should care about. So examples and spaces that you should care about. So the simplest examples, kind of the complexity zero examples are hyperbolic groups and spaces in fact, but let's just say groups. And this class is closed under direct product and free products, but um, more generally, um, relative hyperbolicity. So in particular, every total relatively hyperbolic group is also an HHS. Okay. More intriguingly, and that's what's going to be our main example, mapping class groups are HHS. So that's, I expect most people to be interested in this. Uh, but not just mapping class groups, uh, some relatives of mapping class groups are HHS. So Tech Miller space, Tech Miller space. Uh, with either the, there's at least two natural metrics. And so with either the Tech Miller metric, thank you. Or the Wild Peterson metric. And another class of spaces that are interesting are cut zero cube complexes. I won't say exactly which ones are HHSs, but many of them are. Uh, so, for example, uh, universal covers of compact special cube complexes. So, in particular, right angle arting groups, right angle coxer groups. Universal covers of compact non-positively curved cube complexes, a uh, compact special non-positively curved cube complexes. And let me mention the last one, fundamental groups of non-geometric three manifolds. In fact, okay. I hope that this list of examples is extensive enough to get you interested. Um, so, and as I said, I will not explain the definition, but I will take what's, let's say the main example is mapping class groups. So, the, um, the, um, this class of groups was inspired by machinery developed by Mazur and Minsky to study mapping class groups. So, and somehow the point is to extend that machinery to all the groups on the board. The, the initial point was to extend that machinery to all the groups on the board. So our working example is the mapping class group. And I'm gonna explain to you what Mazur and Minsky did. Of S, where S is, let's say it's closed oriented, a surface of genus G at least still. 
Okay, so the, the idea, the idea that one way to state what Mazur and Minsky did is that you want to study the geometry of, well, the KD graph of this group. And, um, and the way you're gonna do that is to, so is to reduce the study of the geometry of the mapping class group to that of a family of hyperbolic spaces, a certain family of hyperbolic spaces. So hyperbolic spaces are kind of easy to, to work with, so we like them. The mapping class group is not hyperbolic, but let's try to, you know, to make it as hyperbolic as possible. Okay, so let me, what are these, what are these hyperbolic spaces going to be? They're gonna be curve graphs. So let me define the curve graph of the whole surface. There will be other, um, other curve graphs floating around. So CS is the curve graph. And it has um, vertices are, in short, simple closed curves. So to, to, say, to say it correctly, I should say isotopy classes of essential simple closed curves. Did I forget some objectives? And, um, and edges uh, correspond to disjoint curves, or more precisely, curves that can be realized disjointly. Okay, so that's a graph. It has, so as any graph has its metric, its graph metric. And the theorem of Mazur Minsky now has like much easier proofs than the original one is that CS is hyperbolic. Okay, so um, how do we compare the geometry of this graph with that of the mapping class group? We have a, uh, we have a map. So the mapping class group acts on the curve complex, which then gives us a map, which we do not, which we do not pi s, uh, which is the orbit map. Okay, so the stabilizers are very big, so you know this action is not proper, but um, so it doesn't encode the whole geometry of the mapping class group. All right, I should uh, uh, let me say let me say something first. So, it, as it turns out, it's more convenient um, to define. To, to fix a pants decomposition. So instead of fixing a, a point in CS, we fix a pants decomposition, which is a maximal simplex in CS. Right, so I need to uh, curse our disjoint. So diameter is one. So fix pants decomposition, uh, P and pi S of some G is uh, G of P as a subset of CS. So this thing has diameter one, so for our purposes, it's as good as a point. So we're doing coarse geometry. Points and bounded sets are the same. Okay. So we have, of course, a Lipschitz map to a hyperbolic space. And uh, as I said, this doesn't see the whole thing. It doesn't see the whole picture. So remark. Um, let me write it informally, so CS doesn't see 
what happens in proper subsurfaces. Right, so if you have the stabilizer of a curve uh, in the mapping class group, it's, it's a pretty big subgroup, but it has bounded orbits. Okay, so, so we need um, not just a curve complex of the main surface, but also of proper subsurfaces. Okay. So, um, for why a subset, um, um, a subsurface of S, one can define the curve complex of Y. And so we are. So we'll ignore, so there are some issues in low complexity, like for annuli, one puncture torus, four puncture spheres. We're going to ignore that. So we'll ignore um, low complexity special cases. So the, the definition has to be changed in, the, in those cases, but it doesn't matter for us. We'll ignore low complexity cases. OK. Uh, so you have CY, which is defined similarly. You need to add non-peripheral, so non-parallel to the boundary, to the list of adjectives. But that's a good definition. CY is still hyperbolic. And um, uh, so now we had, we had that map, from, which came from the, the orbit map, from the mapping class group to CS. Uh, how do we, we also want a map to, to see why, to compare, once again, to compare the geometry, to, to see, to study the geometry, what happens in that subsurface. And so, uh, so the map is defined as follows. So for Q, a pants decomposition. One can define the subsurface projection of Q uh, to be informally the intersection and more formally the set of curves in Y obtained as follows. So all the curves that resemble the intersection in some sense. So let me draw a picture. Okay, so let's say that this uh, right part is the is y, and we're gonna take some some curve in a fancy composition. So this is some in a fancy composition. And then we are going to find kind of the simplest possible curves that are disjoint from it. So we take a neighborhood, we take a union of this intersection and the neighborhood, uh, sorry, we take a union of uh, this arc and the neighborhood and uh, the boundary and we take a neighbor. I can do that. Okay. Okay. So it's kind of a natural way of, of uh, projecting a fancy composition to a subsurface, and this also um, gives us a map from the mapping class group to see why. Uh, 
this also give us a map, which we still denote, so the map we still denote pi y uh, from the mapping class group to cy. And, right, so now we have some space that's supposed to encode what happens on any given subsurface. So we should be able to control the whole geometry of the mapping class group using those CYs, and that is correct. And one striking way in which this is true is the distance formula. Formula. Again, Mazur Minsky. And so there are some quantifiers here. And what it says is that to measure the distance between two elements of the mapping class group, what you have to do is you have to um, project them to all subsurfaces. I should say all isotopic classes of subsurfaces and measure their distance there. So, um, oh. Okay, so this formula uh, doesn't make sense yet because this might be an infinite number. So we are just gonna ignore uh, small terms. So that symbol. Let me tell you what that symbol means. So that symbol just means that we take, so we keep A if A is at least L and zero otherwise. Okay, oh sorry, it's not equal. Um, it's approximately equal up to multiplicative and additive error. So like in the definition of quasi isometry. Yeah, otherwise, yeah, th when you should, this depends on a generating set. So. Okay, and uh, right, so before I write the quantifier, let me comment on this. So, so this, is, this is great. So, so you, can, uh, you can see what happens in every curve complex. So those are hyperbolic spaces. So you, you have, you know a lot of things. You know that it's hard to travel far from a geodesic. You know, uh, and, uh, and then, you know, Put, so this formula uh, put all this information back into information on the mapping class group. So the quantifiers are for every threshold large enough. There exists multiplicative and additive constants hidden in that symbol uh, so that uh, yeah, for, for any two elements of the mapping class group that holds. Okay, so that's really useful. Uh, now let me, now there's enough, uh, I explained enough material about the mapping class group to, to tell you a bit about what happens for general hierarchical hyperbolic spaces. I wanna keep it, should be enough space here. Okay, so what's the general? Yeah. It's, uh, it's not obvious that it's finite. It's part of the, I mean, part of the theorem is that that sum is finite. Okay. Sorry?
Um, right, I mean, there will be finitely many, uh, finitely many terms here that, that are relevant, and, and anything that's kind of complicated compared to all those surfaces will have a zero term, I mean, a uniformly bounded term. Okay, so the general HHS setup. In general HHS setup, you have some geodesic or, well, it's quasi geodesic space. And part of the data is a collection of hyperbolic spaces. some collection of hyperbolic spaces with uniform constant. And maps to compare x to, to each cy. Or course relief sheets. Um, it's not necessary, but you can always assume it that these are also course least rejective. I mean, otherwise, you just take smaller hyperbolic spaces. Okay. And n, so from the setup. So, so for an HHS, you have a distance formula that, that reads exactly the same as that, as that distance formula there. Okay, so in each of those spaces, each of those spaces in the list comes with a collection of hyperbolic spaces with maps and a distance formula holds. Okay, so let me tell you a nice consequence of the distance formula that's also related to another piece of information that I want to add there. So consequence of the distance formula is that uh, if you take two disjoint uh, subsurfaces, then there's a natural embedding of the mapping class group of Y times the mapping class group of, of Z um, into the mapping class group of S. Okay. So you're given a mapping class in Y, you extend it to the identity, and so on. And the point is that this natural embedding is quasi-isometric, it's quasi-isometric. Um, so, why is that? Because the, the, the relevant distance formula terms live in, uh, I mean, um, are subsurfaces that are contained in Y, and same for the other. So they kind of don't interact. Okay. So in an HHS, you have natural product regions uh, also. And kind of to, to state this, um, so what is this jointness and what is contained? So these are actually part of the, of the data that, that you have. So... Uh, Part of the data is that there's a um, orthogonality relation. So we don't call it disjointness because it would be very confusing in all other examples except for the mapping class group. So this is this is disjointness. So the reason why it's orthogonality is because it corresponds to product regions and uh, nesting relation.
And orthogonality in, I mean, with very similar sentences, orthogonality corresponds to uh, product regions. So, um, so let, let me just write it informally. So orthogonality yields product regions. Okay. Yeah. Right, right, right. Uh, yeah, so relation, th thank you. So these are on this, this S, this, this index S. Yeah, thank you. Good. So on the subsurfaces. Uh, okay. So I think that's all I wanted to tell you about the general uh, for the introduction to HHSs, except except that I, it's propaganda time. So some. HHS propaganda. Okay. So, because you might say, well, okay, I only care about the mapping class group. Why do I want to do more general things? Okay, so one thing I, I'd like to tell you is that um, the distance formula for HHS is, is actually not part of the axioms but it's a theorem. So, so, we, so from the first definition, so from the first version of the definition, we simplified them a lot. So if you simplify the axioms a lot, and now we don't have to assume the distance formula. We have to assume something much weaker, which is much easier to prove. So in particular, so it, um, it's not hard. So it's not hard to show that the mapping class group um, is, um, is an HHS, given that we now know how to prove easily that the curve complex is hyperbolic. So, and this gives a proof of the distance formula, in particular. Um, so, but also it's not hard to show that mapping class group or other spaces are HHS. So, so we, um, and this is very relevant for for uh, the following theorem that I will not, uh, will only state and not discuss much. So it is a theorem we proved with Jason Berstock and Mark Hagen. I should mention that we use uh, the estimate of the asymptotic dimension of the curve graph due to Besvina Bromberg. So, and the theorem is that the asymptotic dimension of the mapping class group of the genus closed-oriented, connected surface of genus G is at most quadratic in the genus. So we improve from exponential to quadratic. So, and, and this proof doesn't live in the mapping class group world. So, so in order to prove this, we construct some spaces so kind of that are intermediate between the mapping class group and the curve complex. And those spaces, they are HHSs, but you know, that's the structure that they have. They're, they're not, they don't appear elsewhere, and they, so they have a distance formula, and so this a bit of the machinery that we develop goes into uh, you know, constructing these spaces and showing reasonably easily that they, they are HHSs. So even if, you're, if you only care about the mapping class group, the proof of this theorem 
and presumably the proof of other theorems in the future will use, I mean, use hierarchically hyperbolic spaces that are not mapping class groups. Okay, that was the propaganda time. Okay, and now let me get to the meat. I'm gonna talk about boundaries. Yeah, so there are, <laughs> um, right, so instead of the, ah, I just deleted. So instead of the distance formula, um, there's a, so right, so notice that a consequence of the distance formula is that if you have two points that are, that have closed projections in every curve complex, then they're closed. So that's what you, that, that's in the axioms, but that, that's actually much, much easier to prove than the distance formula. It's like one page. Non Okay. Uh, boundaries, right? So this class of spaces uh, generalizes hyperbolic spaces and the boundary of hyperbolic space is very useful, so it's natural to try to find the boundary for an HHS. So uh, it's very easy to describe it as a set. Um, the topology is more complicated, so I won't write it down here. But as a set, it's really, really easy. So you have so let's say that you have X with its collection of hyperbolic spaces, and this is an HHS. Then the, uh, the boundary of X with respect to this HHS structure is the set of uh, formal, um, very centric, Sums um, A P, uh, sorry A Y P Y. So it is a very centric sum A Y greater equal than zero. Sum Y is one of what? Let's say so sum for y in f. So and uh, f is um, set of pairwise orthogonal orthogonal uh, elements of s. So of disjoint subsurfaces uh, in the case of the mapping class group. Okay, so why why this? Okay, so oh sorry sorry, and I didn't say where py is. Um, it's important. So and, and py is in the boundary of cy. So that's a hyperbolic. Uh, I mean, that's a hyperbolic space. It has a gram of boundary. Okay, so why this definition? Right, so sum of a y p y. So it is a barycentric sum. So and right, so it's going to be automatically finite. So um, it's always going to be a finite set. And right, so you're summing points at in the boundary of pairwise orthogonal domains. Okay. Uh, no, no, so, so any two elements of, of Y, any two distinct elements of F are orthogonal. Let, let me draw a picture, maybe. 
So you, you have to choose some subsurfaces. So, so you choose subsurface Y1 and subsurface, I don't know, uh, Y2. And maybe an annulus or something is Y3. So these have to be disjoint, so orthogonal in general. And you're summing um, points in the curve graph of this, this, and this. Yeah, it, it varies over all Fs. So it's the sum of these uh, when you know you vary the very centric uh, subdivision and and the fair set of pairwise orthogonal things. Okay, so why this definition? So for every set of pairwise orthogonal elements of S, so you should think disjoint subsurfaces, there is a product region. And now you're going to infinity in that product region. So you're thinking that you're going to infinity in that product region. And so you're going to infinity in one of the, let's say in both, let's say in both um, curve graphs. And so you have a point in one curve graph and a point in the other curve graph. And the slope determines the coefficients. So this is why this formula makes sense. I mean, this is, this is why, how we came up with this. Okay. And uh, so I won't say anything about topology, so let me tell you about um, basic properties of this. So, and uh, here I'm with Matt Durham and Mark Hagan. Is the following. So, if we take, uh, so, an HHS. And we assume that X is a proper metric space, so that that holds whenever it's a Cayley graph, which is most often, or quasi symmetric to a Cayley graph. Um, then, so, uh, first of all, you get a compactification. So, the HHS closure, which is X union, its boundary, um, is compact. Hausdorff um, and X is dense in X bar. Okay, so all the things you you may want. And essentially, when you when working with the boundary, you don't need to know the topology. You just need to know that the boundary is compact, and and a couple more things. Okay, so so here the hard part is compact. So the the other properties are very easy. Compactness require quite some work, but I didn't tell you what the topology is, so it doesn't matter. So this um, right as I said. Hyperbolic spaces are HHSs, so is this the same as the Gromov boundary in that case? And the answer is yes. So when X is hyperbolic, then the HHS boundary is, well, let me write it slightly informally, it's the same as the Gromov boundary. So e even, so, and, and this statement is independent of the HHS structure. So there are 
different HHS structures that you can put on the same hyperbolic space, which if you ever thought about relative hyperbolicity shouldn't surprise you at all. And for, I mean, independently of the choice, you, you, get, you get the chrome of boundary back. Uh, right, okay, let me write it maybe here. So, uh, so let's take maybe G hyperbolic, uh, but also hyperbolic relative to a subgroup. Okay, then, so from the fact that it's hyperbolic, you have the HHS structure that only contains uh, you know, the k graph of G. Yeah, well, let me write k graph of G. Just one element. So from here, instead you get the HHS structure where you have the Kondov graph. and Cayley graphs of the cosets. Well, let me write it. So, so one copy of the Cayley graph of H for each coset. So in this case, there's no, um, there's no orthogonality. And so these sums are just made of one element. So this says that the, K that the boundary of G is the union of the boundary of the Kondov graph, union copies of the boundaries of H. I mean, that, that's it. Uh, okay, so for, let me, Tell you one last thing here. So for X uh, cut zero cube complex, and then the, the HHS boundary is um, is Mark Higgins' uh, simplicial boundary. Okay, these are the basic properties of this compactification. So, I have, okay, now I have to decide what to. Okay, let, let me very, very quickly tell you. So, there are various things that, that we do with the boundary. Um, Let me just mention, kind of as a teaser, and then you can ask me more after the talk if you're interested. Uh, so there's a, so the HHS boundary uh, can be used um, sometimes to, to show existence of rank one element. So to show existence of rank one elements. So the suitable generalization of, of pseudonosovs. And so this, so from this we, we get back, uh, when we specialize whatever theorem we have there, we get back um, handel Mosher's uh, omnibus subgroup theorem. Omnibus. So which says, um, which says that if you have a subgroup, a finitely generated subgroup of the mapping class group, then it either contains a pseudonosov or virtually fixes a subsurface. Thank you. And um, also, uh, Capras gives rank rigidity. For cut zero cube complexes, uh, 
So in for all of those that we can prove that are cat zero. Sorry, just, just, uh, Okay, but uh, right. So, so we have a the the most annoying. So, the the um, biggest drawback of the theory up to uh, at this point is that we cannot yet prove that for every cube complex that admits a proper co-compact action, uh, so that every cube complex that admits a proper co-compact action is an HHS. So, um, which should be true. And so one way of proving it, so you can have fun with this, so, so please prove it. Please, please someone prove it. We're getting an, very annoyed. So if you take, so x got zero cube complex. One way of proving it would be to show the fault that the answer to this question is yes. So you take a cat zero cube complex and suppose that there exists a group G acting on x properly and co-compactly, so geometric. Then uh, there exists some convex embedding of X into the universal cover of a Solvetti complex. So that's a non-equivariant specialness. So. Some think it's reasonable, some think it's not, but yeah, I don't know. Okay. Hmm? Uh, convex. The image has to be convex. Yeah, 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 that, that would be just one way of, I mean, so if the answer to, the, yeah, so if the answer to that question is yes, then um, you can prove that. So the reason this, this question came up is that because this is exactly how we show that uh, for the compact special cube complexes are HHS. I mean, yeah, but in that case you do it equivalently, so this is non-equivalent. Okay. Now the last part of the talk, 10 minutes. I'm gonna ponder the following question. So, what is a geometrically finite subgroup of the mapping class group? Okay. We're in general of an HHS, but let's stick to the mapping class group. We, um, so, well, so in the paper we have a candidate definition, but okay, my co-authors feel more strongly than me that that's the correct definition, so I'm not. <laughs> um, so, Okay, so but but so whatever whatever that is, so the following should be geometrically finite. So the following are examples. So whatever definition you you come up with, if it excludes one of those examples, it's the wrong one. The following ought to be example. Uh, so one. So convex co-compact subgroups. Uh, so one, one, one possible characterization of this is that uh, the map from G to CS is a quasi-isometric embedding. So these I will not define. So which subgroups? Finitely generated, which subgroups, I guess, there are a couple of 
different ways in which this word is used in the literature. So in this case, you have a nice hyperbolic plane in Tack Miller space, and this big subgroup preserves it. So that, you know, that really feels geometrically finite. And so uh, there's a Leninger and Reed um, have a way of combining different which subgroups, which is Leninger Reed uh, Reed's combinations. That it's okay. I'm not going into. I'm not going there, but. It's very, very similar to something you can do in hyperbolic space, and you know it really should work. I mean, it, it should really give a geometrically finite subgroup. Um, okay, so compare maskate combination theorem. I think. So and this uh, right. So so this is interesting because they can produce examples of. Um, Subgroups of the mapping class group that are as close as possible to being non uh, from purely pseudonosov without being purely pseudonosov. That is to say that every non pseudonosov element in the subgroups that they contain is conjugate to a power of a fixed end twist. So there's the least possible amount of, um, the, the least possible non trivial amount of, of pseudonosov, non pseudonosov elements in there. Okay, and so why am I telling you this? Um, because a geometrically finite subgroup should have an extension to the boundary. So, um, so the inclusion of a geometrically finite subgroup. Uh, n let me say need need to have a boundary extension for it to be a proper definition it to have. Because I didn't mention it before, but a natural question is how does PML compare? So you can consider PML as a compactification of the mapping class group. So if, you know, how, how does, so is this any better or worse than PML? So and I want to argue that for the, for the purposes of having a theory of geometrically finite subgroups, uh, our boundary seems to be better. So, um, so the theorem, uh, same authors as that one, that one, two, and three have boundary extensions to the HHS boundary. So, right, these are all hyperbolic groups, so the extension comes from, goes from the hyperbolic, I mean, the gram of boundary to the HHS boundary. Okay, and that is not true for PML. So we bumped into a compactification of the mapping class group that so it's not true um, here due to work of Leininger. I mean, not in general here, due to work of Leininger. So, right, this, um, I take this as evidence that we are on the right way, like we, we are doing something that even for the mapping class group is better than, than what was done before. Okay. Um, unfortunately, I still have five minutes, which means that I'm gonna have to give us a catch of this. <laughs> so sketch for, line, so very, very rough sketch for lining error, for, for Okay, so for Vich and Leininger read. So what are these um, 
which subgroups. So, um, so what what, it, what they do is they take some which subgroups A and B, the mapping class group of the genus G surface, and these are isomorphic better free groups, but you should think of them as fundamental groups of a puncture, so once puncture surface of genus G. And um, so where the cusp subgroups coincides. So you're amalgamating to surfaces with boundary along the boundary. Okay, so. This goes back to Moon's question, actually. Uh, so, the cast subgroups H. So, the, um, um, so A is hyperbolic relative to H, so that's with just for A. So which means that you have, so you have the cone of graph and the coset of H, of, of the cyclic subgroup. And this has a, I mean, the map, the inclusion map induces a quasi-isometric embedding of the cone of graph into the uh, curve graph of CS. So in particular, there's a boundary extension here. Okay. So from the boundary of the, the cone of graph to the boundary of CS, as a, which you can think of as a subset of the HHS boundary. And GH, um, these are uh, multi-twists So it's also easy to find a boundary extension for those um, because you're just moving in a dentist flat at a, with a constant slope. Okay, and so somehow the the whole point so so it boils it all boils down to to showing that the following picture is correct. So you have the map from the amalgamation of H star B uh, into, into the map, well, maps to the mapping class group. So this, so this guy is hyperbolic relative to H. So yeah, it has a conduct graph, hyperbolic relative. And this should still map to CS in a way compatible with that embedding in a quasi-isometrically embedded way, which is the case, which happens to be the case. And, okay. Well, I can stop here. Thank you. <laughs>